Welcome to Happy Today podcast. This is a podcast for those who want to improve service experience of internal services. If you use ServiceNow or other enterprise service management system, then this is for you. So, hi guys. Hi. We are in, in our hack event today and having this one episode of our Happy Today podcast. I'm here today with uh, Janne Kaihila from Tieto and Katriana from from Fujitsu. Mm-hmm. So I hope we will have a good discussion today. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to, to have this discussion uh, with the MSPs about how you feel about the end user experience and what you have done for that. But let's start first from the a bit more personal area. So maybe an interaction, ladies first. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Kat McDonald. Um, Katrina is my Sunday name that my mum uses. Um, I work for Fujitsu for 19 years now, and okay. I'm the, the head of service operations and optimization across EMEA. So looking after in-region and um, global delivery center service desks, service management, um, and looking at how the customers engage with us and how we can then take the value back to them and produce the business value. But more important for me in that space is the experience that they have. So yeah, yeah. it's I've started as a service desk agent and worked my way up through Fujitsu. So I know what it's like to sit and answer the phone. I know what right. it's like to get the continual question coming in. Um, and then how you feel yourself as a service desk agent when you actually solve something. And yeah. for me, that's one of the key things for our own kind of people as well. So yeah, that's me. All right, very good. Janne. Uh, yeah, Janne Kaihla, and I'm from Tieto, and I'm head of the service area Finland for the service to services. And actually, I have exactly the same background. <laughs> I, I bought a bit shorter period. Uh, I started 2009 as a service to specialist, and, and since then I have uh, changed my position in the company. And I also really is all about uh, how how the employees, our employees first, yeah. as a service to specialist, can really. Uh, work best possible way because when they are able to deliver, then they are also able to deliver good customer satisfaction and, and employ experience for our customers. All right, I think you both have a excellent background to to answer the next question. That yeah, uh, <laughs> because your role is not easy. So I would start with a really bad question: that what is the hardest part in your work? I would say people's fear. So we've right. talked a lot today about different um, technologies coming in. So if you take a, your average service desk agent, the usually entry level mm. into an organization, the fear that goes through people when you talk about robotics, when yeah, you talk yeah. about um, optimization, mm. automation, orchestration, AI, machine learning, virtual agents, yeah. all this stuff, and they're like, well, where's my job? Yeah. That's probably for yeah. me, it's, the, it's the, their fear factor and trying to convert that into an excitement about what the opportunities come with all the different technologies that they can then play with and how they can add different types of um, skills to their or their, their themselves effectively. So that for me, that's one of the biggest challenges is not only the, the demographic split that we have with our customers, yeah. so we have people like me who, mm-hmm. you know, when I started at Fujitsu, the Apple wasn't a company. The iPhone wasn't invented. Facebook was still a, a blink in Mark Zuckerman's mind. Um, and now the whole world's changed. So, but I'm not an expert. I'm not an, I've got a lovely iPhone. I use it to make phone calls and I use it to send people messages and take photos. What else you do with it is a mystery to me. But so there's a lot of people that we support that are of that age or are older who, who don't even have an iPhone. They'll, they'll have a, a, an old brick phone that they can just make calls on. And then you've got the millennials coming through who don't want to talk to anybody. They want to embrace all the different technologies. They want to do it through an app. They want to do it themselves. They're, and it is, so there's that challenge as well. It's how you ensure that everybody's happy across our customer kind of base. And actually, I will com- com- complement that with that actually that also reflects still mm-hmm. in the contract levels. Yeah, yeah. And, and basically, <clears throat> we are starting to discussing about customer experience and end user okay. experience. Mm-hmm. But actually, all the contracts are still reflecting the old world, mm-hmm. not looking at, okay, what kind of services we, we should be delivering for millennials. And, mm-hmm. and, and then, so that's a huge challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and another challenge is uh, regarding all automation and mm-hmm. robotics is data quality. <laughs> that even yeah. how fancy autom- uh, robotics you are building, yep. but if, and as an example, we have created the robotic for sending BitLocker, uh, BitLocker this uh, activation mm-hmm. key for end users with the SMS. Totally useless because customers AD is having less than half has a, has a valid phone number there. Yeah. So not very very valid yeah. 
robotic if, if, if the data is not mm-hmm. there. So uh, these kind of challenges in daily life, exactly the fear is one of mm. big factor in the service desk, but in the customer interface, I would say that the, the braveness and the trust mm. of actually putting that also on the paper in the contracts. Yeah. Have, have you seen any, any change in the, in the kind of the requirements of customers now during the last years? How has it is still, you said that it's still like... The I, I would or... say that the discussion has started. Okay. And, and when, for example, uh, it, it just happened a few weeks back, actually, I was seeing one customer and then we are ending up a contract. So we are now discussing, okay, mm-hmm. how we should proceed. And then in this dialogue, we are able to th- thinking that, okay, should we actually change our SLAs more okay. meaningful of the employee experience perspective? But when still, when it comes to the big RFPs, outsourcing big deals of, of all full scope mm-hmm. services, in those ones is very strictly mm. still coming back SL, uh, old fashioned SLAs and they are connected very uh, strictly then to the for example, five-year contracts. Yeah, and it's traditional. So we have a, a lot of um, customers that have the idea of the new. Mm. They, they, yeah. they, they, they yeah. think, I want this digital transformation. I want to be part of that. Yeah. I want to embrace all that. And then their contracts come out and they were made in 1992. Yeah. And they're still traditionally about, right, so we have to have a high SLA on telephony. So if yeah. you have a high SLA on telephony, you drive the behavior of the customer to telephony. Actually, if you lower that, and then you increase the satisfaction around the portal mm. and ac- across virtual agents yeah. and things like that, you actually change the behavior of the end user. Yeah. But they're traditionalist in the sense that the contract comes out and they dust it off and they say, well, I signed it five years ago and it's still valid today. And yeah. it, it, that's more of a discussion journey, I think, and a, a co-creation kind of thing that people, ha- we have to go right. through that. So yeah. people understand that we're not trying to, traditionally um, contracts were built to give companies a stick to beat you over the head yeah. and say, you have to deliver this, you have to deliver this. So the trust is really, really important. So having a tool that allows them to see completely, yeah. transparently, how their people feel about the service, how much downtime they've had, that is really, really valuable to change that conversation, I think. And yeah. that, that for, me, for me, is one of the vital things. Yeah. yeah, I think what we have seen there is like, this communication, of course, we talk a lot with, with directly with enterprises. Mm. It's like, everybody who talks to us is, of course, really interested on employee experience. And sometimes it just feels that everybody is, is pointing to the procurement mm-hmm. as yep. you just did. And the customers do the same. That it, It's like we cannot change it because this is what is expected and we need to have something. Mm-hmm. But for us, we really hate it and mm-hmm. I, I know you're, because it's just trying to optimize the SLAs and KPIs just for one layer of the service. Yeah. And that just doesn't work. Yeah. At least that's, that's what we have seen. By that. Yeah, my proposal actually would be that we re- really think that, okay, it makes sense to make, a, for example, five-year contracts or, or yeah. even longer mm-hmm. ones. But actually, we would take the SLA attachment as a separate, which would develop during mm-hmm. the contract. Not like that we are signing some tight SLAs mm-hmm. in the very first, because that reflects most, most commonly that situation and that environment, that world. Yeah. Uh, but actually, that and it's we would have a totally yeah. different... Uh, this kind of continuous improvement for SLA documents yeah. as, a, as a such. It should so. be matched onto the roadmap. So if you talk at ServiceNow's roadmap, you look at that and you look yeah. at all the cool things that are coming down yeah. that. If you've got a five-year contract that you've built that's still traditional, it actually prohibits you from moving into yeah. that roadmap environment. It stops you from bringing in RPA. It stops you from bringing in yeah. um, orchestration. So having that kind of review cycle yeah. actually means that it becomes far more viable yeah. to actually move and, and not wait until you next yeah. um, procure. Because if you've yeah. signed a five-year deal, you're then locked into that five years later, you then, you've missed out on all this opportunity to, yeah, to, to, to even, even Even you would have a very good dialogue in operational level meeting, for mm-hmm. example, person who is responsible of the customer services uh, mm-hmm. or, or in, in customer ICT environment. Uh, even you have a very good dialogue there and you would actually start raising mm-hmm. some topics that, okay, should we actually start mm-hmm. measuring this and that rather? There's no courage to actually go there and let's open that contract, mm. that five-year yeah, contract, because that's open up the whole, the whole game basically again. Yeah. And there's no enough courage to make that kind of uh, mm. moves quite often. Yeah, nobody wants to spend six months to negotiate again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's understandable, but I really understand the point because 
That's why let's I say you have yeah. a five years deal. Mm. Yeah. You are using service now with your customer. Mm-hmm. Mm. The product is not the same. Mm. Even service now would be should be giving you but much much better mm. yeah. uh, end user experience only by the tool when yeah. it develops. Even yeah. though the service desk quality would be still the same. So it's there are so many not only the service desk that is influencing and of course digital mm. transformation, mm-hmm. customer is changing tools all the time. Yeah. Of course, that influences the yeah. user experience. So that's mm. and and the cloud area. does as well. So moving yeah. away from an on-prem data center yeah. traditional delivery model into a cloud hybrid environment, then that changes constantly as well. So you have to have everything changing at the same pace, yeah. following the roadmaps, but also the contracts being able yeah. to kind of reflect that and to have the flexibility in it to take yeah. it forward. That that's why I would be very interested to see that actually the SLA wouldn't be an attachment yeah. in the contract. It would be a living document. Mm-hmm. Living PBA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but what about now, we have heard about already today about what will happen maybe to the industry and what is happening with service now and so mm. on. But what is your expectation in near future? AI, everybody's talking about, but what is the reality? Chatbots, is it ready? I would. I can. I can start at least for in our customer environment. Basically, uh, well, the data quality is yeah. huge challenge mm-hmm. there. Uh, another one is uh, as uh, the cultural change on, on the behavior of end users uh, of utilizing uh, different digital channels than mm-hmm. traditional emails and, and phones. Uh, but also uh, the service desk. It's it's a bit different call centers world comparing to the service desk when we are supporting customers business processes, business applications, etc., and the contacts can be whatever. Yeah. So basically, the use cases uh, are a bit, bit more complex. So we are actually, at this moment, putting a lot of effort and focus to actually bringing the chatbots, uh, automated solutions and machine learning to help the, cust- uh, the service specialist in their work, right. as they're combining the human mm-hmm. and the robotics together to, to, better, to bring better customer satisfaction. Okay. I mean, I, I think, Going forward, there will be, or we are ready, we, we use virtual agents now. Mm. But virtual agents only work really, really well when you've got humans at the back end teaching it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you have to have that mm. kind of the, the thought leadership mm. through that and how, how is somebody going to ask a question to get the right answer back? It has to be in, in a conversation. It has to be able to use the different languages. It's not mm. machine um, translation sometimes doesn't allow to have the nuances of how somebody is actually going to speak. And, and so I think from a, from my perspective, people are absolutely vital in that robotic processes as well. If the data is not right, it's yeah. not. It doesn't matter how many robots you've got doing. Yeah. It's never gonna never gonna help. But actually, it's how somebody follows that process. Mm. And it might be written down in one way, but actually they do all this stuff as well that nobody ever wrote down. Yeah. So you have to capture all yeah. of that and build that into the yeah. robot exactly. too. And I think so. So I think I mean I made a commitment with one of our customers. Um, a year ago that we would remove email as one of the channels and we would remove phone. And she was like, oh, you can't do that. And I'm like, why would we not? We should be in a position where we can actually recognize when you've got machines going down from proactive monitoring. We should be able to see when there's cash building up. We should be able to be the orchestration in the background mm-hmm. that says that machine needs a reboot or that till's not going to work anymore or this. We should be able to do all that. So you shouldn't ever be in a position where you need to pick the phone up. But what we should be able to do is support and add value through the other channels, through web chat, through virtual agents, through portal. Mm. And I think that we are nearly there. Mm. But it goes back to the demographics of the end user environment. It goes back to their behaviors. It's what they're used to. So many people are used to picking a phone up. And I never do. I never phone the bank, and I never. I, never, I don't phone Amazon. <laughs> I just shop quite happily. Um, but in a workplace, a lot of people are still wedded to the traditional. I'm going to pick the phone up because I get a better result if I phone Sammy directly, fix it for me. Yeah. But actually, they would get that same experience through a virtual agent. But it comes to trust. It comes to to how they how that's communicated within their organisation. But I think we're far, we're not far away. Yeah, yeah. and then I basically uh, all that. Uh, how I'm seeing how it's developing at this moment as the service desk, as a service desk role and the specialist work is actually, uh, and what has been my answers to the people when then they're asking, mm-hmm. okay, am I losing my job? Mm-hmm. But actually, we are changing the service desk, uh, meaning that actually when all these kind of predictive uh, analytics is coming to the uh, workstation environment, etc. So basic IT support goes behind the curtains, yeah. which turns to be invisible. 
but actually we are going in the service desk for customer business processes. For example, retail sector flow management or, or some uh, uh, hotel booking systems or wherever. So basically we are going to support customers' business processes. And there is so huge amount of data what you should mm -hmm. know then. And they're also coming that, okay, you need to have a platform and knowledge bases which actually provide you the knowledge to provide value for the customer and users. Mm -hmm. Because in those processes, it's again, they are still in the first curve of the automation activities mm -hmm. and not possibly always as that formal as IT, traditional IT yeah. processes. So I, I see a development there in our way. In a way, I see kind of a, I also have been always so worried about the, the agent's work because it's so, mm -hmm. you're taking phone calls from all over the world, mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. with, uh, with whatever IT problem, mm -hmm. customer is angry and you have to know everything. Mm -hmm. Nobody's like that. Mm -hmm. And then we have the millenniums coming in. Mm -hmm. When they call, they have already checked ten yep. YouTube <laughs> videos. Yes. So the problem is really, really hard. Yeah. So, but that is kind of where they're living now. But I think what you said about how this area is changing, I would say that there shouldn't be fear. Mm -hmm. There should be kind of a hope even yeah. there, if if we really are able with the technology to help them. Yeah. Mm. And they are the best people to support the virtual agents. So all our virtual agents are supported by people that did used to work on a service desk. Yeah, yeah. So they know how that conversation is going to go. So, so they build it. the back end. Yeah. So <laughs> I, they do try. My, my English isn't that good. So <laughs> it's a struggle. But also with the roads. So usually when you had service desk agents came into an organization of Fujitsu size, they would want to go into technology. Mm. They'd want to go into um, being engineers or, or to getting into code and all the rest of it. So what we've done is we said, well, actually, you come in and write robotics. So mm. you go and do the robot. So we put robotic processing in, in their training. They do their own robotic train right. use cases. Yeah. So they can see all the different things that they would do and waste effort on that were repetitive and doing the same thing time and time mm. again. And they go, I can make that. Uh, I can get a robot to do that. So we called him Desmond, our robot, yeah. because RPA I find difficult to say. So <laughs> Desmond, the robot, does all that. So they do all the things and get Desmond to do it. So that gives them more time to spend actually giving value out to a customer because but they're finding their own use cases rather than somebody coming along and saying oh you need to do that <laughs> well, guys uh, the last question mm -hmm. uh, we have now about 30 big enterprises here so if you summarize what is what your company and you will do in the next year or two to really push the end user experience so this is your star moment <laughs> 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 Well, basically, uh, you could we could uh, go through what kind of uh, technical solutions there is, but uh, I would actually go the detail of what we just did and where we are taking learning curves. And this is actually something uh, which is bringing the in which details we are actually looking after when we are talking of customer experience. Uh, one of the other employees was actually doing uh, a studying in a university Finnish language, and she needed to do a, of course a thesis. And then she did the thesis of utilizing foreign language as, as a support function. As, for example, it, it's commonly known, known that our biggest uh, customer center is in Estonia, and Finnish speaking persons are roughly, uh, native speaking Finnish speaking person is like roughly half, and another half is persons who are not speaking natively Finnish. So we did the study of does it that influence to the customer service? And we had quite interesting um, expectations that it might have because there's a cultural differences. There's a differences of are you picking what word when you are daily, uh, serving the customer? We were re recording uh, hundreds of calls and collected that with the happy singles data. So we were looking at how satisfied customers are. And then we started analyzing call by call and actually, it doesn't have any impact of the customer satisfaction. There was much, much more important things where to focus on. How you lead the call. Yeah. How, mm -hmm. Are you saying, how can I help you? Et cetera. So, so, so it turns actually to the behavior. Yeah, yeah. And then this is just a small example. And now we are taking those outputs to our call, co uh, call coaching uh, method, et cetera. But uh, this is a, nothing technical as such. But I just an example how 
we are seeing the customer experience and how detailed level we want to uh, deliver your customer satisfaction or your customer and, and employee experience to the better level. Yeah, so it's about soft skills. Mm. It's about soft skills, yeah. yeah. How about you, Kate? So I think, I mean, I am determined to fulfill my promise to my customer <laughs> about returning the phones off. So we're working towards that. But I think also for me, it's using, um, um, with Happy Signals, it's not just about the desk for me. It's about all the different service management processes that go alongside that. So it absolutely feeds into problem management, into change management, how people, you know, so you have a change that goes wrong and then you can see the impact immediately because you'll get a, a dip in the, the, the scoring that comes back in. So it's how we take that and then we develop it further across the whole SIAM interface as well. So yeah. when you're working in a, a SIAM world where you've got multiple different suppliers and we'd have to work mm. together and it'd be like, I'm not sharing anything with you and you want to share. Yeah. It's, it's making it so that it becomes that transparency. We've all got different as companies. We've all got unique things that we can do. We've all got really strong areas. We've got areas we're possibly not strong in, but we have to all work together to deliver to our customers. Yeah. And I think that that's the key thing over the next kind of um, 12 to 18 months for me is pushing through with SIAM to ensure that we have all the relevant different tooling working together to deliver that overarching kind of delivery um, outcome based to the end yeah. user, yeah. to all the right. customer. But hey guys, this was, we could continue like yeah. half an hour more. <laughs> that was fun, let's keep doing it. Keep it coming. <laughs> yeah, but let's, I will thank you guys and then thank you. maybe we'll continue this discussion with the beer later on today. Yeah. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.